Hello everybody. Today we are dealing with uh, an important issue in an infodemics management course, the issue of the behavioral foundations of infodemics. This uh, is a very, very important point that uh, is of concern for everybody who is seriously interested in the policy design uh, that concerns infodemics. And uh, this really means that uh, we have to deal with uh, the deep behavioral factors that affect the willingness of people to generate and to share information that can be questionable or unreliable or entirely fake and constructed or even uh, the, the fruit of a conspiracy theory. So what are the reasons that push people to behave like this? Um, I think that uh, the first thing to stress is that infodemics is not necessarily the production and generation of fake news. Infodemics is all that concern an overwhelming flux of information that is uh, produced and shared, today classically through digital media, that uh, is so overwhelming for people that it really puts pressure on their capacity to correctly process and classify and uh, of course uh, also on what kind of information to trust, what kind of information to consider reliable. So in a situation in which this amount of information is overwhelming, people have to make decisions, make choices, and uh, generally they rely on fast and frugal ways to decide who to trust and what to trust or what kind of information makes sense in any specific situation. So it's very important to understand these mechanisms and especially what are the origins of these mechanisms because this is where I think uh, the, the big game is being played in terms of our future capacity to reorient people towards a more uh, responsible way to produce and to disseminate information. It's very important to stress that the, the current infodemic crisis is of course strongly linked to the current pandemic, but at the same time not necessarily the pandemic is the origin of all the infodemic issues that we have been facing in the, in the last few decades. Clearly the very development of the digital, digital society is creating the premise for uh, infodemics because clearly we are generating today such a flux of data that uh, uh, completely trespasses every possibility for people to keep under control what happens. Um, and clearly, there are lots of different uh, social challenges that can be generators of um, infodemics on different levels. And uh, at the same time, these social challenges not only generate uh, lots of uh, data and information, but they also raise anxiety and fear. And the two things, as we will see, are deeply connected. Think, for example, of all the issues related to inequalities in current society. What are the origins of this inequality? What are the causes? What can be done, for example, to enable people to have a, a better life through a more uh, uh, responsible use of uh, collective and individual resources? Or think of climate change, of course. So, uh, in this case in particular, we are facing uh, changes that seem to fly over our head, but that at the same time, of course, uh, more and more influence the everyday life of people in ways that are uh, starting to be very detectable for people and, again, are cause for concern and fear. Uh, think of migrations and all the effect of migrations, for example, from the point of view of uh, the potential, not necessarily actual threats to people's lifestyle or the fears that are related to the construction of a truly multicultural society. Or think of automation and all the threats or perceived threats that have to do with the development of artificial intelligence, for example, as a potential destroyer of future jobs. And so again, a threat to future well-being for so many people. All these situations are situations in which a myriad of different informations and explanations compete to find their place into the minds of people, to shape people's worldviews. And clearly, there are uh, distinct uh, infodemic uh, issues that are related to each single one 
of these uh, social challenges and of course there are many many more that uh, create potential infodemic threats but the point is that in the case of the pandemic this uh, infodemic threat is further exacerbated by the fact that we need a fast coordinated reaction. So in our case it's not simply facing a social challenge, but facing a social challenge as quickly and as effectively as we can. Whereas the time frame for most of those crises is relatively long compared to what is happening today with the pandemic, here the problem is how we respond to the crisis on a daily basis and clearly this means that it's extremely important to orientate the responses and the behavior of people as quickly as we can towards the most constructive and pro-social form that we can imagine. So this is why the pandemic has become in some sense the root of an enormous amount of a real flourishing on infodemic research that is probably going to structure a future field, not only of research, but also policy design. And this is the reason why we are today uh, having a course on infodemic management. So where do we start in trying to conceptualize the origin of this? So, OK, there is this a huge flow of information. But why is this so threatening to us? In the end, we could say humans are rational beings and they should be able to distinguish the information that is reliable and trustworthy from the information that is clearly uh, fabricated or uh, lacking any special evidence. I mean, this idea that humans are rational beings and in every circumstance are able to filter out uh, irrelevant or fake information is, of course, very far from the daily reality of how humans behave, decide, and so on. And not only because we can have limitations to our rationality, but because we have learned in certain situations in which we have to act quickly to act on the basis of simple rules that do not take the time to make all the fact checking and all the research that is needed to a certain whether a certain piece of information uh, is reliable or not. We have to decide very often on a very quick basis and so clearly these rules of thumb, these reactions are uh, predominating in our behavioral response. The point to start from is the fact that as humans in particular we have developed uh, very strong social routines when we feel ourselves in danger. In case of danger, we tend to think that uh, we need not only a fast response, but also a response that enhances our cohesion with our social reference group. We need to be closer, let's say, to our, our allies to defend ourselves better. So, a situation uh, where we feel in danger, in a situation in which we tend to reinforce group feeling, but reinforcing group feeling is also reinforcing potential hostility for people who are outside the group. So in a situation of danger, there is a natural influence that leads people to think in polarized terms. Us and them. The people who think like us, the people who behave in a certain way that we approve of, and the people who don't. So from this point of view, Clearly, polarization is an issue because in a moment in which we have to coordinate on a common effort, dividing society in different groups, some of which can be reliable and some of which are not, is of course potentially detrimental. But uh, So the first point is that uh, creating a group cohesion also means uh, relying on moral emotions that uh, can work very well within the group, but they can drive a big gap against everybody who's not part of the group. And the main issue, from this point of view, is all this amount of social emotions that revolve around the notion of trust. The real problem in a situation of danger is I need to trust other people in order to enhance our possibilities of common survival, we have to cooperate, and we have to cooperate exclusively with the people who we really trust. So the point is, how is trust creating a potential problem? 
in a situation of uh, infodemic crisis? Well, you know, trust is a very complex construct. Uh, and it's very important to understand that our mechanism of trust in situations in which we have to face uh, very complex phenomena whose origin and causes is very difficult to uh, figure out. Of course, we need explanations that are uh, palatable to us, explanations that make sense. And the point is that these explanations that make sense in a situation that is very complicated, uh, facing challenges that nobody is really completely expert about, as it can be in the case of a global pandemic, clearly means that we have to, again, choose which of the many voices around are worth our trust or not. Well, the point is that uh, as humans, especially in situations that are very complicated for us, we tend to think narratively. To trust uh, an explanation, what we need is basically a convincing story. But stories are uh, extremely important for us because they establish uh, a very clear uh, link between different facts that uh, creates sense in deciphering these facts. But also at the same time, there can be also a natural tendency to, let's say, go for... Uh, deceptively easy ways to connect facts. So narratives sometimes can be extremely attractive because they seem to explain everything. They seem to respond to all our doubts and fears, but not necessarily these narratives are accurate depictions of those facts and especially accurate depictions of the relationships between facts. So the point is that uh, in some sense uh, we want to have narratives because that's the best way to understand the complexity of certain situations. But at the same time, this desire of simple narratives that help us explain facts can be deceptive because it uh, can lead us to trust sources that are not necessarily the more reliable. On the other hand, the problem is that in a situation of anxiety and fear, we want to be reassured about the fact that we understand what is going on. And so if a situation is explained by something that is too complicated or something that is not completely accessible to us in terms of our knowledge and in terms of our mental categories, clearly this in itself can be a source of mistrust. So what is the main problem that we face in a complex social situation like a pandemic? That most of the knowledge that is really reliable and accurate is expert knowledge. But expert knowledge for most people is not something that can be directly accessible in terms of their mental categories, in terms of their uh, scientific background, in terms of their uh, daily experience. And so, there is a natural tendency for people to be skeptical about expert opinion. Or basically, people have to make a choice in this sense. They simply can say, okay, this guy is an expert. I have evidence that he or she is an expert, for example, is a fa famous uh, professor in a famous university, so I need to trust this guy. Or they could also say, okay, he, he or she is an expert, but what do I know? Maybe these professors are wrong in the end, and especially if they make an argument that I cannot understand, maybe it's better to trust somebody who speaks like me, who reasons like me, and in the end provides me with something that I can control conceptually and in some sense something that I can trust. So in situations like this, there is a natural crisis of trust in the experts. Because experts, in a sense, are uh, providing explanations that, however accurate, are not controllable according to my standards. And if in normal situations I could simply say, okay, you or she is an expert, all right, in a situation in which I feel threatened, in a situation in which I fear about my survival or the survival of my loved ones, 
I could say, no, I cannot run the risk of trusting somebody who I don't understand. So the real issue from this point of view is that uh, a natural reaction in situation of overwhelming complexity and overwhelming flow of information is to create what we could call a sort of low trust alternative to science that is producing my own explanations that make sense from my point of view. So what we could call in some sense uh, folk science, something that people uh, derive themselves from bits and pieces of information that they can make sense of. So from this point of view, we are in a situation that is very similar to what economists generally call credence goods. Imagine that your car is broken. You have to go, in this case, to a mechanic uh, workshop to have your car fixed. But the problem is that uh, the mechanic there says, OK, your motor is broken. I have to substitute the motor and it's going to cost you an awful lot of money. You have to just believe because you don't know how to repair the car. And if the mechanics say, OK, it's the motor that is broken, what can you do? But especially in situations in which uh, you get conned very easily about this. And for example, we had bad experiences. And so you have grown skeptical about the trustworthiness of mechanic uh, technicians, for example. You could say, OK, in the end, uh, probably I'll uh, hear from someone else and I will, uh, for example, spend some time in going to three different workshops before deciding whether I want to make your, my car fixed by you or by someone else. What I'm saying is that in situations in which there is a dramatic in, in asymmetry in information between the specialist and myself, of course, I can grow skeptical on the reliability of the expert if I think that the expert has an interest, like in this case of repairing a car, to make me believe that something is broken whereas it is not. The point is that once I develop this low trust attitude towards some kind of experts, it's uh, relatively understandable that I generalize my mistrust of experts from one specific category to a more general category. So maybe it can be the case that I had, did never have a special reason to, let's say, distrust uh, epidemiologists. But if I had a problem with, uh, let's say, electricians or, uh, let's say, uh, car repairs, I could think that in the end, everybody, when it's possible, tries to exploit their informational asymmetry to manipulate me in their own interest. And so, paradoxically, I can grow skeptical about the expert knowledge, even in fields in which I did not directly have bad experiences. So, how can I solve this kind of problem? Well, the problem is that as a consequence of my mistrust, not only I tend to, let's say, rely on sources that uh, I feel make sense to me. And so from this point of view, for example, the types of fake news or conspiracy theories that make everything simple in terms of arbitrarily connecting things or giving gratuitous explanations for certain facts that uh, apparently make sense. So not only this, of course, becomes more attractive for me, but I can develop myself an attitude to construct my reasoning to interpret facts according to the same logic, according to a logic that makes sense to me given the specific tools that I have. So the point is that not only I believe, let's say, in fake news or conspiracy theories, but I become myself a generator of this kind of content because I feel comfortable into a cognitive space that I can dominate, that I can control. And what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this, of course, is that by relying on uh, these kind of sources, I am uh, contributing to, let's say, pollute the informational environment exactly like in a kind of global commons situation, like the environment is a global commons, the info, the, info, the informational eco ecosystem we live in is a global commons. So the point is that the more people 
get accustomed to the idea that the only trustable information is the information that they cognitively control and contribute to generate this level of information as a consequence of this and so to further create and disseminate this kind of uh, knowledge that is uh, deceivingly simple and deceivingly, deceivingly able to explain facts, the more I am polluting the informational environment and so I am elevating the risk of what we could call infodemic risk, infodemic contamination of the informational ecosystem. So, uh, the point is that uh, this form of, uh, let's say, folk science becomes for people a way to control anxiety, a way to make sense of what happens, but also a way to organize a mental resistance towards a scientific approach in the proper sense. It's not incidental that the same people who are skeptical about, for example, official medicine, tend to be believers, let's say, in uh, flat earthing, or tend to be believers in other kinds of conspiracy theories of a different kind, on different domains, but nevertheless, that share the same simple knowledge structure. So, this kind of correlations is a consequence of the deep nature of this kind of information, and how this information taps into the opportunity of reassuring people. So, from this point of view, the natural question then becomes about how can experts play a role in this particular sense? How can we counteract this kind of tendency? How can we rebuild trust, for example, in people? Because without rebuilding this trust, whatever we can do is not fixing the basic problem. So it's not a matter of doing better science or it's not a matter to make a better communication. The, the problem is that if people don't trust you, they don't even listen to you. They filter out uh, whatever you say just because you're saying this and you're not part of their tribe. You're not part of their uh, community that they think they have to adhere to in a moment of crisis, in a moment of fear. So from this point of view, we are not uh, favored by the fact that uh, the digital platforms in which these contents are disseminated function according to a logic that is, uh, I mean, up to now, now things are changing, but of course uh, lots of damage has already been done. But up to now, the main concern of platforms, digital platforms that uh, generate and disseminate content, social media, for example, has never been content, but it's always been engagement. So what is important is the flow of attention that is generated by certain type of content. For, for a very long time, Exactly those mechanisms that made people feel comfortable with, uh, for example, fake information were also reinforced by the fact that this fake information being so attractive generated a lot of attention. And so it was reinforced by the digital platforms rather than being counteracted by them. So the problem is that we have accustomed people to think that everything that magnetizes, everything that attracts attention makes sense. So if something is viralized, is, uh, if all people repeat a certain piece of information, there must be some grain of truth in this kind of information. And from a cognitive psychology, by the way, we also know that people tend to think that appealing fictions are in some sense twice as true as facts. And this is also the reason why, for example, when you debunk one specific piece of information, people tell you, yeah, okay, Maybe this one is not particularly true, but in general, this is true. And the, this, in general, has to do with the palatability of the narrative that is behind there, not the fact that there are other pieces of fact that necessarily corroborate that specific, uh, let's say, information like uh, that, for example, COVID does not exist or COVID has been fabricated in a laboratory and so on and so forth. So, from this point of view, we have to understand that the only way to constructively tackle this crisis is, in some sense, to use the same means in a different way. And in particular, this means that uh, if people need to trust a community, the only way to really make the difference is to make people familiarize with the mechanisms of science production. That's the only way. If we do not create a true democracy of knowledge, there is no chance that we can really systematically address 
the challenges created by the dark side of infodemics. In particular, science, as we know, is not democratic. People have learned, for example, that culture can be democratic because everybody today can use, let's say, social media to share their own photos, their own creative stuff. And this has grown people accustomed to the fact that they can actively participate, for example, in uh, collective creation processes. But in science, it's not that easy. In science, you cannot simply just share whatever comes to your mind, because as we know, science uh, is a very painful and complex process of uh, probation of ideas, of uh, uh, vetting of ideas in ways that can be also extremely complex and frustrating for the scientists themselves, imagine for people. But uh, the point is that uh, the frontiers, for example, of uh, citizen science, direct engagement of people in the mechanism of production and creation of knowledge, of scientific knowledge, are probably the only way in which we can really enable people to grow a different attitude of trust toward this kind of information. So if science does not became, become more participative, it's very difficult that we will be able to convince large constituencies of people, especially in moments of crisis, that the very complex and sometimes obscure mechanisms that define scientific practices today can be the thing to rely. And in particular, you know, it's about learning by doing. For example, there has been an experiment in a German city a few years ago that had to do with uh, the urban replanning of a square. And the problem was that, of course, every citizen had their idea on how to redesign this square. The genius move of the administration in that case was to launch a video game in which everybody could have been the planner and uh, de develop their own version of the refurbishment of the square. The consequence of this was that uh, citizens playing with this particular game were not, not only generating some interesting ideas, because sometimes it happens, but in particular they were putting themselves in the shoes of the urban planner. So when they returned to the public deliberation process, they were much more constructive with their ideas and proposals and criticisms, because now they understood what it took, what were the difficulties in planning a square. Something that before running that exercise before playfully gaming with it, they were not able to appreciate. So as a consequence of this, we really need to work in terms of an infodemic management that is not only crisis management in terms of debunking information, but also working on a long time strategy of direct involvement of citizens in scientific processes and in citizen science. And this is particularly important in health, because in the case of health, as we know, is not only a way of, let's say, deploying the collective intelligence of people, but is also an issue of making people more aware of the consequences of pieces of scientific knowledge for their own lives and choices. So if we are really able to create a process of direct involvement from the bottom up, in scientific processes and so a big investment in what we could call a flourishing, knowledge flourishing revolution. If we are able to do this, we are probably building the basis for, let's say, a future solid strategy of counteraction of infodemics. So the point is that uh, this also has to be done in narrative ways. The fact that people tend to think that narratively does not need to be something to defend us against. Because narratives can be used also in very powerful ways. So it's very important also that from the scientific point of view, we engage scientists in forms of uh, narrative communication that can be especially powerful from this point of view. If you think of figures like Carl Sagan or Richard Feynman, we know that even extremely complex uh, pieces of science and knowledge can be communicated in an extremely effective way. So it's very important that scientists take the responsibility also of, uh, not all of them, but, but I mean, the ones who have uh, this, uh, this talent and this inclination to work as public intellectuals much more than they do today. So the responsibility is not only to produce good science, but also to create uh, narratives that enable people to participate, to share,
this cognitive domain in ways that make them trust this particular way of tackling reality and providing explanations for reality and devising solutions for reality. So the problem is that in some sense, we have to acknowledge the non-democratic nature of science that is clearly top-down, that is clearly hierarchical, where clearly you have experts that know more than non-experts. But the really important issue now is to create the conditions for the non-experts to trust the experts. And uh, just uh, using the principle of authority is not enough. The principle of authority is even more alienating the people that for whatever reason don't think they can trust the experts. So the only way to work on this is really in terms of long-term strategy, not for solving now the current pandemic crisis, but clearly to, to lay the basis to not have in the future analogous infodemic crisis, is really to work on participative citizen science projects, especially in the fields that have to do with public health, with that, which have to do with epidemics, that really enable people to feel part of the game, to understand what it takes, to, to, to tackle these kind of challenges and then to feel that this is part of their experience space. This is something that they can trust and especially this is something that can contribute to their own safety and survival. So I hope that this brief reasoning gave you the basics of uh, an issue that clearly has uh, far-fetched implications and that I think really becomes one of the most important structural directions of future policy, design, research and experimentation in the field of infodemics. Thank you very much for your attention.